So hello everyone. We are going to be continuing our study that we have uh, started. Uh, we already had two weeks of this study on inner transformation. And um, as you may remember, the first topic that we talked about in terms of inner transformation was about self-awareness. So during two weeks, we talked about self-awareness, the importance for us to uh, not be afraid to really try to see, analyze ourselves, to see things, not with a sense, as we always say, not if with a sense to put us down, to say, oh my God, how much I still have to fix in myself. Everyone is in the same boat, right? We all have that, so don't feel bad about it. It's just a process and it is our process. And the only way for us to go through it is actually to be able to accept uh, in a way that there are things, uh, why do I say in a way? Because acceptance doesn't mean to say, okay, this is the way I am, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. So what I'm, I mean to say in acceptance is, okay, there are things that need to be improved, but uh, the idea for me to focus on them is to uh, have hands-on work and start doing what I need to do. What is the advantage of doing that? Because we we live in a society that we want, to, oh, we always wanted to know uh, when we are doing things, uh, what am I going to gain with that? Well, we are going to gain peace of mind. Okay, we are going to gain happiness because all of that, the less we involve ourselves with things that can compromise our, our lives, our way we relate to the world, we are going to be uh, subject to the results of our actions. So the more we throw goodness in the world and all of this, the more this is what is going to be coming back to us. So this is the main uh, uh, importance point for us to, to think about. So you have a lot to gain with that. We, and uh, uh, we can see how much uh, with all this understanding and the, the spiritual knowledge that we are gathering through our studies, how much this has been impacting us in our day-to-day -day lives. Things that before were so hard for us to deal with, to accept, or to, you know, to try to do something about it. Now we see uh, under a new perspective. And, um, and so this is the main reason why we went, uh, we suggest that we, uh, we started this study course. And it's uh, also the basis of spiritism. When we are talking about spiritism, we are talking about bettering our spirit. So uh, everything else is just a way of, um, of us being able to, um, to do that ourselves to uh, really uh, be cap being capable of working in the self-improvement. Uh, which, before we start, would you like to make any kind of, any comment, any considerations, or should we go share uh, whatever? I mean, remember that uh, we always encourage participation and sharing. Um, it makes our studies even more interesting and dynamic, okay? So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, let's see if everything is okay now. Can you see it uh, okay? Yes. All right. So 
remember that when we were talking um, about uh, inner transformation and we are using as basis um, a book that I put together and hopefully, I don't know, we, we published this year in English um, and using as basis for this study, the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount in a correlation with the 13 virtues of Benjamin Franklin, and uh, which goes uh, totally in tune with what we find in terms of virtues, in terms of moral code that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. Let us remember that, uh, and it's important for us to, uh, to put this here, uh, that even according to Gandhi, if we were to lose all the religious and spiritual writings in the writings in the world, and we only had left the Sermon on the Mount, according to Gandhi, that would be enough. And this coming from someone that is not even a Christian. So because he understands and people in general from, from different religious denominations understands the core of the teachings of Jesus in this particular occasion, especially, which was the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount could be considered as a ladder, you know, the first one, the first uh, beatitude that Jesus says that it's related to uh, humility. So blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's an invitation to humility. And uh, it makes so much sense when we are thinking about this process that we are talking about of um, getting to know ourselves. Sometimes we think we know ourselves and uh, how many times we will say, oh my God, something happened and I had a reaction that I was not expecting, right? So what does this mean? That I do not know myself that well. I do not know how am I going to react before, you know, good things, surprising things, bad things, whatever, all the things is, is just an, always a new discovery about ourselves and not to mention that because our moods vary from day to day, what today could be accepted or seen as being a very good surprise, tomorrow I may say, no, I, I, I'm not in the mood for that, right? So we keep on changing. And, uh, and the first thing that will help us in this process is actually humility. Humility in the ter in terms of saying, okay, I, I know I'm still not perfect. I may think the world of me, but there are always more things that I can learn, that I can achieve in terms of personal uh, improvement. And humility is, is, is what we are going to be talking about during this uh, first uh, explanation of the, the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, the Sermon on the Mount goes like this, and seeing the multitudes, he went, Jesus went up a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs it's the kingdom of God. His scholars say, that more than just saying what Jesus was uh, presenting was almost like a song, a chant, because he was using in the original language, he was speaking at the time, which was Aramaic, he was uh, using uh, rhythms, uh, rhymes, and uh, the, the the tone, and all the way the way Jesus was actually presenting the thing, the the this uh, sermon on the mount was almost like he was singing to people, 
or at least uh, 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 saying like in a way of a poem. Uh, one thing that is really interesting is that the word uh, in Hebrew that they use to the blessed R is the, the word Ashray. And uh, this is the first word as well that people were familiar from Psalms, from David's Psalms, which make them very comfortable because they were saying, I mean, or, or they were thinking on the back of their minds uh, that, that that was familiar. That was the way that they knew about the old scriptures, the way that uh, David addressed them in the Psalms saying Ashray as well, and Ashray in, in terms of inviting them to betterment. And Jesus was very careful in speaking to people according to their own times. This is why he used parables, for instance, because it was the way that people, you know, that could not read and write, uh, could memorize the teachings and this way in terms of rhymes and all this. So he started by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for there is the kingdom of God. Again, very intriguing, very intriguing for the civilizations of that time, because they don't want to be poor in spirit. They don't want it to be humble. They, they, they wanted to, to see the appreci appreciation of the world. And they had different concepts than this one that Jesus was presenting to them. So this is why it was so revolutionary for the time. Even the word that they use it in Greek to at the time to translate it, because we have to remember at the time they use it Hebrew, um, Aramaic, Greek and Latin because of the, the, the domain of Roman, because, because of the domain of Greece in terms of intellectual values. Uh, we have to remember Socrates, Aristotle is all that. And the words they use in, Ar uh, in Greek is a word that is, say, is called um, makarios. And Macarius, in, in terms of, you know, being a place of happiness, they refer to as being the Mount Olympus, where the gods lived, where you had all the happiness, all the prosperity. And uh, they use it to denominate one of the, the island that they had in Greece, I think it was Cyprus, as being almost like a Macarius, meaning they had, uh, they had so much reach and natural resources that it was a place of heavens and happiness. And so now Jesus says that Macarius prosperity, happiness, felicity actually means be poor in spirit. So do you see how hard it was for all that to be implemented and accepted? And many uh, were confusing, uh, confused about when Jesus, what Jesus had in mind when he referred to the poor in spirit, he was not implying people that would have no intelligence. He meant to say that in order to enter spiritual life on good terms, a person must cultivate simplicity of heart and humility of spirit. He also wanted to make it very clear that as long as a person has just two special qualities, simplicity and humility, that person, even an ignorant one, has a better chance to do well and prosper in the spirit world than a knowledgeable individual who thinks oneself clever than God. This teaching of Jesus is the consequence of the principle of humility, which he insistently, insistently presents as the essential condition for happiness. If Jesus promised 
that the poor and lowly will be admitted into the kingdom of heaven. It is because wealth and power too often fuels pride, whereas an obscure and laborious life is far more likely to be conducive to moral progress. So in the uh, Beatitudes, when we talk about, especially this, this set, the first seven ones, Jesus is talking about this achievement of their virtues. And like you said, we said, being the steps of this ladder, the first one to be humble, to accept I, our uh, good things, perfections, imperfections, weakness, and uh, everything in order for us, for us to go from there. And what is the promise here? What is the reward? Kingdom of God. What should we understand about kingdom of, kingdom of God? Meaning us going to heaven. That's the most common image that we will have. And being there, living in eternal idleness, laziness, playing harps or so. Not exactly the kingdom of God, you know, that represents ultimate perfection, happiness, peace is something that is going to be conquered within of us. I do remember that uh, not long ago, I mean, a few decades ago, we had even a, a, the Pope, I think it was the Pope uh, John Paul the, the sixth, I, if I'm not mistaken, that he said uh, for the first time that heaven and hell was not a physical place, but a state of mind, right? So it is not a state of mind what we say the kingdom of God is being hell. It, it, I mean, if it's not a physical place and it is a state of mind, it is a state of well-being. Of, of, of feeling and, and connected and as we are part of the, the whole creation and start understanding this creation. Uh, I'm going to stop now for you to make questions, make comments. Anyone? It's, yes, on. It's very interesting because in this way everybody can achieve this goal poor rich boss employee then it's amazing to to see this first step it's for everybody to achieve and not for privileged people and Mm -hmm. It's interesting what you're saying, because it's always good also to emphasize that uh, Jesus here is not condemning uh, wealth, okay? It's, uh, it's a, a matter of how we place ourselves, and we will see along uh, our study today that it has nothing to do we may find person that live in a very difficult financial condition, extremely pride, you know, lacking all humbleness. And we will find people that are really wealth and, and, and is the opposite, is the other way around. So it's more of an inner condition than actually related to what, uh, or in terms of possessions, what we do have. And um, the only thing is that unfortunately, when we, uh, we do not have that much to fend for ourselves to, you know, to, to, to work for, you know, the bare necessities of life, uh, we may get very too much distracted with the world in a way of forgetting as well what we are doing here. And the main purpose that is our, you know, uh, work on our inner progress. Anyone else would they like to say something? Yes, Marlene, go ahead. Next week, I'm moving the carrot, okay? Okay. <laughs> For right now, what I learned about humility personally 
is that I was always making judgments, you know? Um, people I, I, I meet, uh, my neighbors across the street, um, you know, I think, well, how could they believe those things about the election? They're Republicans, you know. <clears throat> and, and so um, I, I tr I'm trying to look at them and others as they have their right um, to what they wish to believe. And that my job is to just accept them as they are, love them as my neighbor, and stop being critical or judgmental. It, this is absolutely true, Mar Marlene. And, and, and one thing that we should remember each and every day, right? Because um, it, it's not only about, you know, your political position, but it, I mean, when we talk about, uh, uh, well, even religious ways or things that we uh, attract us that not necessarily attracts other people and the, the where they are, and where is a humbleness in this uh, whole thing? Is us remembering that in the same way that we may not uh, accept or understand uh, people's choice, they will not understand ours. And, and, and even when we consider that we are in a more advantageous position, always remember that there are people, they are further ahead of us right that uh, they will look they will say okay in this area you're doing fine but what about right and this is where humbleness we always remember uh, um, uh, help us uh, on top of like you said not being too critical judgmental being more tolerant and understanding that for you know from the perspective where people are they the scope of understanding they have of certain things is one and that we cannot force anyone to think like we do and uh, but, uh, you know, progress is here. Progress is uh, a fate for everyone. Uh, remember that in the spiritism, we do not believe in fate, but there are certain things that we can say is like a fate. And, and progress is a fate. It may take uh, longer to some people than to others, but we all are going to be progressing uh, one way or another through uh, hardships to good experiences, our choice. The more we, re we rebel and stay behind, the more difficult it will be. But uh, it's a very important point that you made. Anyone else or should we go ahead? Yes, go ahead, Mark. Uh, I'd like to ask if um, spiritism um, believes in uh, destiny, in other words, okay. All right. Well, since we mentioned that fate, let's open. Let's uh, let's just uh, quickly go into that. Uh, not in the way that we imagine, because sometimes we 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 try to say that it's my destiny, uh, like you know, it's written on a stones, and we had no choice whatsoever in what was chosen for us and how things are going to develop. What we do know is that before our incarnations, having been presented with uh, areas that would be our strong points and weak point, weakest points, um, together with, let's say, uh, our orientator, very much like when you go to school or a college, that you have a, like a coach, uh, right, to help you uh, select what is going to be better for you. We will be also receiving this kind of guidance saying, well, according to your achievements and your weakest points so far, 
if we you choose going through or this way having this kind of experiences in terms of the main events where am i going to be born who is going to be my parents what kind of financial situation i'm going to have um, uh, how much am i going to be able or not to receive a, a, a a good education, um, marriage or not, children or not, all of those main events in life um, before our incarnation was kind of agreed upon. So we will say, okay, if I pursue this career, uh, it is going to help, you know, help me in achieving not only more uh, intellectual things that I, I wanted to achieve this incarnation, but also I want to, to work in this direction and achieve, uh, you know, uh, like when you work with people, for instance, okay, when you have a direct con contact with people, you have to be patient or you have to learn patience right to deal with people so sometimes we choose a profession because of that because that profession will require some personality traits that either we have it already or we need to develop it but the the, the i mean the gaps we are feeling on our day-to-day -day lives so there is no destiny in the way that we understand because even the, the things, the main events that we chose, more or less uh, how long we are going to live, what kind of uh, main events in terms of physical health is going to happen with us, even when we decide that, we may change along the way according to the way we live. And I think this is very beautiful because uh, it, 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 the marriage is all ours. It's not like we are, you know, puppets on the hands of a creator puppeteer that is uh, taking us whatever the puppeteer thinks is the best way for us to go. But like we said before, progress is inevitable. So we may resist uh, the strength of the wave that is going to take us to progress, but it's going to happen sooner or later it's going to happen. And, uh, and this is one thing, Marlene, that uh, it's quite hard sometimes when we are getting in touch with all this, uh, this spiritual values and knowledge, because like we commonly say here, it's so much easier when we can blame, uh, you know, luck for everything, saying, oh, I don't know, uh, God was playing dice and uh, mine were one and one, you know, <laughs> the other one was six and six, why mine had to be one and one, I got so little, right? So no, no, this is not what happened. This is us, this is our responsibility, and even the things that let's say we pre-select, it is because of our marriage or the marriage that is going to make us uh, choose a, a way of life or things, main events in our lives that are going to teach us uh, about things we don't know or did not value. For instance, and this is just an example because one hard thing about spiritism is that there, there is never just one answer for a question. Uh, couples that cannot conceive. Maybe in previous incarnations, they were very careless with children. Uh, and, uh, and because of this, they, you know, the children they had or not, uh, where um, had to face a lot of things in life. And now they had to, they have to develop in them this parental desire 
so that when this happened again, they will not go into their same old pattern of taking it for granted. But this is just an example, okay? Please don't think that if you don't have child, child, a child, it's because th this happened. This is just an example, okay? Um, following even the, the, that, that the teaching from Jesus, uh, if a hedge is a motive of scandal, uh, better not to have the hedge because then you will go into the same pattern as well and it's going to compromise your life even more. All of these are, are, are very complex, but for, for the time being, I think the important thing is for us to remember that. All the choices are ours, but the choices that are going to be presented to us are related to what we have been doing with, uh, with us as immortal spirits in previous incarnations so uh, up to the moment. Because let's, let's say that I, uh, that I say, oh my God, I want to be as rich and successful as Bill Gates. Then you say, really? In the previous incarnations, you were even king and queen of a big kingdom. And look what you did. You, you, you messed up so many times because of extreme richness. Wealth, do you really think this is the, for your best interest? And, and, and here, it's not even then they are going, then I mean our advisors, they are going to forbid us to, to live a life like this. They are going to advise us and show, look, look what you did in the past. There, if you choose this path again, there is a chance that instead of reaching your aims, your goals, you're going to, like, you know, a board game, move back to two houses, right? So uh, this is what uh, happens when we, um, uh, we have this kind of situation. And, uh, and it's so incredible, okay? Uh, someone uh, dropped me as being the host here. That's why my background changed. Okay. So really, our previous incarnations um, guide us into what we think of as our destiny. Is that right? Absolutely right. Exactly that. Thank you. You see, Marlin, sometimes I, I, I give very silly examples, but I mean, I do not go to law college to after graduation say, well, I, I don't want to practice law. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a surgeon, right? I mean, I don't have the competence to do that. So in a new incarnation, it's the same thing. I may wish to do some things, but uh, if I'm not equipped uh, to do those things, uh, uh, how, can I, how can I do that? So I'll have to go according to the credit, you know, the achievements that I, that I have. And everything with a name always, always, to make, to lead us to happiness. It's not to make us fail. It is not to punish us at all. It's just uh, a result of what we have. I have amassed this much credit and I'm able to deal with this much situation. Not less, not more. This is what is necessary for me. And this is what sometimes is hard for us to understand, even in terms of uh, our parents, for instance. And uh, we know how hard it is sometimes, you know, how, how much many people have, you know, difficulties in relationships uh, with uh, their parents and sometimes do not even have one. Um, and we say, oh, I was born in the wrong family. No, we are not. For whatever reason, that was the family you had to be born, even if it was for this case, for you to value family. 
for you to be born in such a dysfunctional family that now you start valuing, valuing uh, what it is to have, uh, you know, uh, a more harmonious families. We will see harmonious families in the world. And so we will come to the conclusion that is also uh, something that we have to work for. It's not just, you know, blaming everything, everyone else that is in the home, but it's something that we have to, to learn. Or if you are in a dysfunctional family and you are so much better than they are, so maybe you were there to help them not to be that much dysfunctional and not to put yourself apart. So you see, it's, it's always, it's, there is always a lesson, there is always a reason why we go through things. Always with a name for us to learn lessons, to achieve virtues, and with that, to reach peace of mind, to reach peace and happiness. Okay, so let us go a little bit more here. So uh, generally speaking, in our world, knowledgeable men and women consider themselves so erudite that believing in God or anything spiritual for that matter lowers their position. So, and unfortunately, this is one, some, one thing that we see and uh, we quite often we mention that we could compare ourselves, you know, to the phases of, you know, from being born to reach adulthood. Uh, and when we, we, we reach our preteen or teen, teen age, where we, we believe we know more than our parents, we, we know enough, they are old, old school, they, they are already, you know, uh, not uh, knowledgeable of the current things and current values. How much we hear that from uh, from people, right? From our children, and sometimes you know there are not that much of a gap because there are parents that are started having children very early, and there is not as sometimes that much of a gap. Sometimes even two decades or less than that. How how do we change that much in two decades, right? Anyway, well. It seems that unfortunately, the more we start developing our intelligence, there is a tendency, which is not a rule, okay? But there is a tendency uh, to dismiss uh, anything spiritual. It's starting with God. No, it's just something that we don't know yet, but uh, we know more than God, <laughs> right? Or that would be a God. And, um, and this is where, what is lacking? Humility. If we look at history, uh, there was, we can see how much we didn't know, how much we have achieved today. And the, the proper conclusion would be, okay, I may think that I know everything today, but what am I going to think in a hundred years from now? Right, according to what we see in terms of history, 100 year, 100 year makes a, a huge difference in terms of uh, advanced, uh, advancements as a whole. Remember, I always like to, to mention that as well. Uh, up to 1870s, so the, ninth, the end almost of the 19th century, according to the church, women did not have a soul. So for uh, in the before Christ, after Christ era, for 19th century, we were considered not to have a soul. That's why we were traded. And actually this week I was thinking <laughs> how difficult it was to be a woman, right? I mean, you have no value whatsoever. Right, it was, oh my God, that's why everyone and up to today, 
many couples wish they have they have a son they wait for a son instead of a girl i think is this you know uh, it's still this idea that a woman uh, means cost because you even have to pay a dowry to the husband to please take this woman away from my home i don't want her to have this burden anymore right <laughs> so my god this is we are talking 19th century and not to mention you know the right to vote for not only women but uh, other ethnicities and, and, and so we see the, how much we, we change the, you know, going from chariots to automobile, right? All of that. And so for us to believe that we know it all is a big lack of humility. Okay, are we better? Oh, so much better. There is much ahead of us. Oh, yes, so much ahead of us. Comments, questions? Okay, so let's see. In fact, some go as far as to believe themselves so all-knowing that they can deny the existence of God because anything in this world can be explained by, by their sciences without recourse to God. Let me see if this is... Uh, and ironically, by refusing to accept the fact that there is an intelligence and scope of action vastly larger than their own God's universal intelligence, they sabotage the process of their own intellectual progress, as well as the expansion of the knowledge they so highly prize. So it's like, you know, I have an equation that works and I, I, I remove the main part of the equation. So it's not going to work anymore. I remember one joke, I don't think I have it here, that uh, uh, is uh, it's like a cartoon. A little guy comes to God and say, listen, I, uh, uh, he, he was working with clay and said, I made life. And he said, well, now you have to, to, to make your own clay right so the raw material <laughs> is it still not something that we can do okay we can clone okay you can clone but what about the raw material who did that and how things happen right and so if anyone has a right to be proud it must be god after all god created the world without any help from you or me God himself is uncreated, eternal, and utterly faultless. God himself dwells in an approachable life. God is mighty, glorious, perfect in beauty and splendor, omniscient. No one and nothing can compare to God. God is the only one qualified to be proud, and yet God is humble. So... I think this is a lesson for us in terms of uh, not only in terms of our relationship to God, because it's so far away and, and achievable, right? But even when we think about um, uh, the greatest um, individuals that set foot on this earth that we know of, not only in terms of the religious uh, view, spiritual view, of course, we're going to say about Jesus, Moses, and, uh, and others, and Gandhi, and Mother Teresa, and, uh, and so many, but in terms of intellectual achievements, like uh, Socrates, like, uh, you know, Pasteur, like so many others, like, uh, that have been working uh, for our improvement. So even when we, we uh, or a Francis of Assisi, for instance, when we think about, about them, we understand that they, there are things that we still need to, to work in ourselves, or I mean many things, to, to walk in this direction. For the moment, it is enough to accept uh, 
that we are imperf imperfect beings so far, but our destiny, and destiny in this sense, <laughs> or fate in this sense, it is to be perfect beings, perfected beings, not perfect because perfect is only God. And, uh, and the only way to go through this path is this kind of acceptance that is going to require humility that is going to require from us this knowledge, this understanding. And uh, for us to, to, to end today's, uh, the, the correlation with uh, the 13 virtues from, from uh, Benjamin Franklin, remember that uh, there was only 12. And when he showed to a friend, the friend said, well, they are wonderful, you know, this set of virtues that we, you, you put to yourself, but you're missing the most important one. And the most important one, according to his friend, was humility. And Benjamin Franklin was humble enough to accept. He said, you know what? You are absolutely right. And he included, he changed it 12 virtues to 13 virtues. And he says that humility in reality, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride, disguise it, struggle with it, beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive and will every now and then peep out and show itself. You will see it perhaps often in the history, for even if I, in this history, for even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. So um, we are not talking about an easy thing here, right? Uh, but uh, it is the path that we have to be taking. And in this process of, you know, self-awareness and inner transformation, uh, there is no way we will go through that unless we start exercising humility. Are we going to be humble all the time? Absolutely not. We, we do not even know uh, or have any kind of idea what it is to be humble. And humbleness, uh, the display of uh, um, um, humbleness in our world is so misinterpreted. Uh, many people will even think that is a fake uh, position, you know, false modesty, things like that. Uh, and uh, but little but by little, we always start appreciating. It always is, um, it strikes me when I hear stories about uh, Francisco Xavier, the, the one that we call Chico Xavier, right? The famous uh, and well-known and respected spiritist from Brazil um, that died um, uh, 20 years ago, actually this year. And uh, he was so humble, but so humble that would uh, make us feel bad and sometimes not even understanding because you know we could acknowledge how much uh, more evolved spiritually speak he is from us and uh, but it's exactly this evolvement the the same way that um, Socrates replied to his colleagues at the time Yes, I am the wisest man that there is in Greece today as the oracle predicted to you because I'm the only one that I know nothing. You see, so uh, for us to achieve this position, I think is the goal uh, to understand that regardless of how much we know, there is so much for us to accomplish. And when we think like that, we will never look down, you know, to people that may not yet have reached uh, the current position we find ourselves. So 
for next week, we will talk about the opposite, pride, okay? <laughs> As part of this uh, study. Um, okay. Uh, any questions or comments that you would like to? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, a lot of food for thought, right? <laughs> so homework for the week. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to exercise humility, okay? Be mindful of your thoughts and actions and uh, take notes if you want to take notes. <laughs> all right, but just think about it, all right? Okay. Thank you, Jasara, for your beautiful <laughs> insights. Yeah. Thank you.